Bariatric surgery does nothing for food addiction. You're, you're told that it's gonna do something to the hunger hormones. Well, it does for about 10 days. And then they come back in full force. But then what you have is a food addiction with no way to eat the food because you can't eat it because right. you don't have enough room for it. And so do you regret having the bariatric surgery? Hi everybody, Dr. Joan Plant here. Thanks so much for joining me with these conversations about how to recover from processed food. I have this amazing person today. It is Susan Amanda. She and I have been working together for some years. She is a nurse. She is certified in the Food Addiction Recovery Advocate Program. And she is just, I always love having her on my screen. She's got really great stories if you are thinking about bariatric surgery, if you are thinking about becoming uh, trained in food addiction. She is going to talk about what happened to her and all the, all the joy that she has in her life now as a result of getting on top of the food addiction for herself and also for her patients. So Susan Amanda, thank you so much for coming here today. I appreciate you. Where would you like to start? Where in your story would you like to start? Um, well, I'd like to start with, first of all, uh, yes, I am a nurse. Uh, I work in, uh, I work with several hospitals right now. I work from home. I'm a, I was a case manager. Now I'm a nurse navigator uh -huh. and I just, Go ahead. Yeah, nurse navigator, that you are in a great position to use knowledge of food addiction. So tell us about that. I, uh, I have the opportunity to talk with patients on the telephone that have just been discharged from the hospital to see if they have questions about their discharge instructions or uh, anything help and help them make uh, appointments and so many of them are having issues with their food, with their sleep, with anxiety. And I can use the motivational interviewing that I've learned in the ARC to help these patients and also some of the tools that I have in the ARC. The light meditation video, how to help with pain, how to help with sleep, how to uh, help with anxiety if they can't control their food. A lot of them will tell me that. And I'll help them find a, a exercise or a resource to help them with that. So do give me a before and after. Like before you had your, your not just your food addiction training, but you are a food addiction recovery advocate so you uh, you have the 20 percent of the problem that is food but you got a whole nother 80 percent you got a lot of other modalities that we know from research you know i'm a researcher i got to see the research uh, we know from research work really well for people so do kind of a comparison of before and after now that you have training in all these modalities and how to handle food what's the quality of your job Oh, I'm so much, I'm so much happier in my job than I was before. I have uh, more resources to give patients. I know how to do mindful self-compassion for myself mm -hmm. and remain calm and cool under stressful situations mm -hmm. and uh, use tapping. And I even share those with the patients about how to oh, use tapping. So cool. Yeah, there are lots and lots of things that work to make people feel much better. And Western medicine, we need Western medicine. Oh my gosh, we need medical services. I myself, I have asthma. I use an inhaler. I'm on my knees grateful for pharmaceuticals. But there's a whole other, you know, one author, a World Health Organization doctor said, you know, the medical industry has about 10% of healing options. There's another 90% out there and I just, and they work, you know, the research is there for them. The things that you're talking about, meditation and visualization, breath work, all that stuff, certainly diet. And so I just imagine I'm not a nurse. I, I run our online programs. I just imagine that the difference between being able to, like empower your patients with all these other things that they can do for themselves 
would be would take like a really difficult job. You just have a few tools. You have pharmaceuticals. You have um, surgery, and now you have dozens of tools. And people like using these modalities. It's easy to learn breath work. It's easy to learn tapping. So I just imagine the quality of your job has changed enormously. Oh, yes. Uh, one of the things that people, a lot of people don't realize is that when uh, modern medicine, the modern mm -hmm. medicine first came out, that they had a choice of which way to go. They could go with treating the diseases are preventing the diseases. And the medical model was chosen to treat the diseases instead of prevention. And there is so many things that people can do to prevent diseases, which include the food they eat, the stress that they have, how they deal with their life and their stress, all of those things. There's so many more things than taking a pill yeah. that, that you can do to, to help uh, to help you with these diseases. And uh, one of the things also that I was uh, a uh, certified chronic disease manager also. Oh. And one of the things that we learned from that was people have trauma. They have to be allowed to tell their story. And if they can tell their story, sometimes that helps them with a the chronic disease like diabetes, heart disease, you know, like if, if you, if I was talking to you and you were maybe a diabetic that hadn't been taking care of yourself and I said, well, Joan, what happened? What happened to you that you uh, haven't been able to manage uh, taking this pill or eating this right food? Then you might tell me a story that happened to you when you were younger or a child even that has affected you your whole life and that no one ever bothered to ask you what happened. Brilliant. Brilliant. I want to go back to what you said earlier about the motivational interviewing. Because mm -hmm. I had an enormous reaction to that. I have been in a lay, what's called a lay educator position. Oh, for 28 years now. As soon as I got off the, the Sugars and Flowers 28 years ago, I started helping other people. So I was a lay educator. But I, nonetheless, I went into every discussion thinking, oh, I got to figure out this problem. Oh, I've got to, I've got to exactly give the right advice to this person. And that's totally gone. It's very, very stressful to approach a person that way. And it turns out from the motivational interviewing research that if you elicit another person's ideas, if you express respect, and uh, praise them, they're just much more likely to change their behavior. And I noticed right away that I really looked forward. I didn't have stress uh, in talking to people anymore because all I had to do was elicit their ideas. And people know what they want to do. They know how they want to change. And so eliciting their ideas, praising them for those ideas, affirming those ideas, making a plan based on those ideas. Oh my gosh, it just changed everything. It's so easy now. How did that impact you? Um, that not only impacted me in, in dealing with my patients, but it also impacted me with uh, dealing with management in nursing. And nursing is a very stressful high paced job and uh, sometimes we have to deal with uh, we have to deal with doctors we have to deal with managers uh, we not only with patients and patients families but it helped me in dealing with difficult situations in management uh -huh. and uh, actually um, I was actually able to use some of the motivational interviewing with a situation with a uh, director of my department Oh, tell and, us the story. I would love to hear this if you can, if you can. Um, well, I, I'll, uh, to put it uh, in this way, I was being marginalized because of my age. And uh, I was able to use the motivational interviewing that uh, I had learned to turn that around and uh, get 
get satisfaction through uh, management and our HR department. And I felt, I, and I didn't have to lose my cool. I didn't have to storm out of a meeting. I didn't have to do any of those things. I used my tapping. I used my motivational interviewing and I was able to come to a positive conclusion for me. Yes. Well, this is what we're finding with our health professionals is that the environment that they're working in is getting worse and worse. The, uh, these, you know, investors are moving into hospital sy systems, uh, clinics, they're buying up, buying up, buying up. And then they're putting incredible pressure on the employees to do more, do more, do more. And, uh, the, the need for what you're talking about, it's the managers are stressed out and they're just passing the stress through to the to people on the front lines. All that's going on at the same time that people are getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And we just looked at research showing that 93% of Americans have a diet related diagnosis, not surprising Americans are eating 73% of their food in processed foods that cripple cell function in eight ways. So this, this, what you're talking about, this ability to communicate in a respectful, eliciting, resolving, affirming, planning uh, kind of way uh, yeah, is invaluable because we know, of course, that stress creates disease. Definitely. There is a direct correlation between stress and disease. So for yourself, what have you noticed um, since you've really immersed yourself in the uh, food addiction training, since you've gotten all these skills, like personally for you, for your well-being, for your happiness, what's the before well, I really have some exciting news because I went to I, I went to my doctor this past week. Yeah. And when he uh, he was looking at my record and he saw that my birthday was coming up and I'm not going to say my age, but he said that uh, he said, "Oh my goodness, your birthday's coming up!" And then he goes, "Wait, you can't be this age. What is going <laughs> on? You are in such good shape for someone your age compared." And he remembered when I very first came in, my diabetes was out of control. Even though I was a nurse, my diabetes was out of control. I was just sick. And now my hemoglobin A1C, for anybody that's diabetic, they'll know that that's the blood level for diabetes. And you want that to be below seven. If you're a diabetic, you would prefer it to be a six. Mine is around a six. Yeah. Uh, so I was just so excited and he made me feel so good because he was like, oh, my goodness, you're in such good shape. You can't be this age. And so I loved it. And so, uh, yeah, so that was for me, that's a, a big thing. Another thing is just being uh, using the mindful self-compassion that we learn yes. to, to be kind to myself, treat myself like I'm my own best friend and mm -hmm. uh, give myself advice like I would to a friend. And I don't overreact. I don't have the, uh, I have been known to actually storm out of meetings because I would get so upset. And now I use, I have all the tools to use, including the food. Food is a tool. We can use food to keep oh us calm. Gosh. A number one tool. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Susan, I'm just so excited. I am 72 and um, I'm actually getting healthier. I am. Now I've been in our daily living program, the ARC, for going on six and a half years, and I have finally resolved enough of my childhood trauma. I grew up in a terrible household that uh, my asthma is getting better. You know, the tightness in the chest is releasing. So it's amazing to be this age and still feel like I'm getting younger. So let me just ask you, um, if you don't mind, give us all the backstory to this. This is so wonderful. You're in a job. You like your job. You're able to manage your managers. You're able to manage your patients. You're getting more satisfaction and you're not letting them pass stress onto you and you're not letting them marginalize you because of your age. 
but how, what's the backstory? What were the, what was childhood like? What was young adulthood like? What was middle adulthood like? Yeah. Um, how did you so get here? I came from a family that used food. So the whole family used food. Uh, and my father uh, was very abusive, but I understand, I realize now through all the training that I've had and the art training that he was also so deep in the food, he couldn't control himself. Mm -hmm. So I realized that. So, and I have forgiven him for the things that he did, but um, so I had, I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust my own intuition because of that uh, being treated like that, a raging father yeah. Yeah. who couldn't control his temper, couldn't control yeah. any, his eating. He finally got his eating under control when he was older, after we were all adults. And I was so glad that he did because it cha completely changed his personality. And uh, so through the arc, I've realized how I can forgive him. I don't forgive his behavior. I can forgive him, though, because he didn't know any better. He was deep in the food. My mother... Uh, also, uh, she wasn't raging or anything, but she was so deep in the food that she would not, she didn't want any kind of, um, uh, she wouldn't deal with any kind of uh, issues that, uh, because she was just so deep in the food and wanted to be numb to everything. Okay. And so, uh, but my food addiction started as I believe from the stories I've been told when I was about 18 months old, my grandfather overfed me a fruit and until I threw up and my whole family thought it was funny. Well, it wasn't funny because I think that's where my food addiction started that I equivalated food and being full with love. And so I've gone my whole life. I have been on every diet plan that you can name. If you name one, I probably tried it. I mean, hundreds and none of them worked. And I felt like a failure. And then I found out through the art that it wasn't me who failed. It was those plans that yes. failed. Yes. They were not yes. They were not designed for me. And that's what we learn in the art is to design our own recovery program with our own food plan that fits us. Yeah. yeah. Individually. So the whole food issue just goes away. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn your production methods. You have enough food. You know how to pack it up to take it with you. You just know how to manage food. And you know, because we do teach people how to recognize a food reaction, people don't know that depression, irritability, anxiety, disrupted sleep, fatigue, skin outbreak, stomach. I mean, I think most people know that a stomach ache is related to food. Well, you would think, but I remember this one story of a person who nearly died from irritable bowel, from Crohn's, finally figured out to change his diet, went into his doctor and said, oh, I have great news. I have changed my diet and it's gone. And the doctor said, no, no, no. Diet has nothing to do with it. So even if you have stomach aches, you're, you might get a medical professional who tells you food's not related to that. Inflammation issues. And, you know, because processed foods cripple cell function, cells in the brain, cells in the skin, cells in the heart, cells in the lungs. Anything can get better when you get off the processed foods, but you have been given deliberately through the uh, craving business model, these deeply embedded cravings and getting your brain to stop craving. It's a whole nother skill set. So you realize that you at 18 months, you were already being provoked by loving, well-meaning people into food addiction. How did that manifest for the rest of your life? Uh, it manifested in uh, overeating constantly. And then through your uh, workshops, I found out the reason I had to eat to feel good was because uh, the fuller your stomach is, it, you're, you release feel-good hormones that help you calm down and feel good. So mm -hmm. I would have to eat until I was just full. Mm -hmm. I mean, overly full. It was, uh, it was kind of ridiculous, but I couldn't control it. Yeah. And so it, 
at some point I heard about the uh, bariatric surgery. And so I, I was approved and I tried it and I found out through, I found out through myself and then later through research and then information that you provided that uh, bariatric surgery does nothing for food addiction. You're, you're told that it's going to do something to the hunger hormones. Well, it does for about 10 days. And then they come back in full force. But then what you have is a food addiction with no way to eat the food because you can't eat it because right. you don't have enough room for it. And then I had like a huge anxiety attack. And thank goodness the woman that I was in her program for the bariatric surgery, she said, Susan, you sound like an addict. You sound like that you're having an, a withdrawal. And she encouraged me to look for something that would help me. And that's when I found the ARC. I knew that I was addicted to food, but the last time I had looked, the ARC was just starting. So I wouldn't have found it, but I found it after that. And I mean, I found my people. Yeah. And so do you regret having the bariatric surgery? Um, I don't regret it because I've learned mindful self-compassion. And so I look at having it as a, that I, that it's a tool and that I've learned other ways to control my eating with the art. And, uh, I, I, sometimes I wish I hadn't had the surgery and that I had found the art first, but okay. it is what it is. And, that's how I'm dealing with it. Because just like you said, it's 20% the food and the 80% is how we deal with our life, with our, uh, with the, our environment, with our work, family, all those things. We, we have to learn. We do learn through the arc how to deal with all those things. Yes. Yes. It's so the arc is a hundred percent research based in terms of it. You know, there's nothing in there that doesn't have a study supporting it, right, you know, it's beneficial effect, but it's also very, very, very skill based. Mm -hmm. you know, people are surprised after they've been in in the arc for some months to realize how many skills they have. It's very easy to learn skills because you're. We broadcast fifteen hours a day, fifteen mm -hmm. out of twenty four, and so you're picking up skills from listening to conversations like you would with friends. It's the easiest way for the brain to absorb and learn anything. It's through a conversation with people who already have those skills. So your brain just naturally uses its drive to fit in and, and absorbs those, those skills. So here you are. Tell us, give us your top three benefits. And I, um, first of all, I did really want to compliment you. You had bariatric surgery. It didn't work. Bariatric surgery is very expensive. It's very uncomfortable for a while. And, you know, you pulled the good out of it. You said, well, but but now I have these self-compassion skills and I have these management skills. But for somebody who's thinking, but I also heard you say, I do wish I'd found the art first. So please, 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 if you are desperate and thinking about bariatric surgery, or if you're desperate and you're thinking about a freaking $4,000 program, please join the ARC first. It's a daily living community. It works through, um, through just being around healthy people. It's not expensive. Uh, please try it first. I have, I've just had so many conversations. Well, I spent $4,000 with this person. They demanded all the money up front. I had to take out a loan and now I'm going to be paying it back for three years. But I knew by month three that she couldn't help me. Don't have that story in your background. Susan, top three benefits, top things that you just absolutely love. I love the fact that uh, it's uh, the arc is almost 20 almost available it is available 24 hours a day because when there's not a chat or call on i have a pod i can post in in facebook messenger and i also have uh community calls i can listen to 
that are recorded and I can listen to those. Yep. I can ask for help yep. any time of the day uh, in either a chat or a call or on in a pod. I can ask for help if I'm having a really bad an emergency or something with food or a trigger or whatever. Access. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> what I another thing is that it's science based, and because mm -hmm. I'm a big skeptic when it comes to uh, someone telling me to use something. So I love the fact that it's science-based with uh, research and um, you can see where all the, um, where all the information came from. Uh, a third thing is that I have made so many connections through this and friends that, uh, and watch people grow and they've watched me grow. And uh, so that would be my three big takeaways. All right. All right. And you go to the doctor at your age and he says, you can't possibly be that old. <laughs> yes. Yes. Susan, I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful to you. And I appreciate your coming on this show and I appreciate you inspiring. I can feel the inspiration coming. That you've inspired people to look for this uh, very easy food addiction recovery and uh, just have these great results. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank and you. Friends, I'll see you on the next episode of Conversations with Dr. Joan Ifland. Thank care. you. Thank you so much for coming today. I appreciate your interest. Tell the next person. You can walk the next person out of this processed food nightmare with what you learned today. See you next time.